We learn early that our innovations are only as strong as the foundations they are built on. Build them with strong support and they will soar. Engineering innovations are no different. Without a strong foundation, successfully developing and deploying them will only get harder. Because as design complexity continues to rise and time to market cycles shrink, siloed design and test workflows will be pushed to their limit. Today's enterprises are striving for digital transformation, striving to develop and deploy technologies at market speed, striving to improve execution within and across development teams, striving to make agile, well-informed strategic business decisions. As a company with deep roots in engineering, at Keysight, we understand. It's why we've created the Pathwave platform, a complete data sharing and solution building platform that enables agile integrated design and test workflows, no matter how large or small your enterprise. The Pathwave platform is the strong foundation you need to master your next innovation. It streamlines your development process, speeds your time to deployment, and gives you insights to make better, faster decisions. Are you ready to accelerate digital transformation in your engineering enterprise? Contact Keysight to learn more about the Pathwave platform today. Discover the strongest foundation to help your business soar. All right, welcome and thanks for attending. My name is Ian Ripke and I'm the Product Marketing Manager for Pathwave System Design. We're here with our partners from AGI to talk about the integration between their systems toolkit software and Pathwave System Design. I'm joined today by Washington Wedderburn, Director of SDK Product Management at AGI. Hi Ian, thanks for inviting us. So Washington, I, I think we can all agree that the changes happening in aerospace systems design are quite significant and really represent a new way of designing products for many of these companies. That's correct, Ian. Just like commercial products, aerospace systems are becoming increasingly complex thanks to technology advances and push for increased features and capabilities. Companies are looking for ways to speed up their time to market through reduced prototyping runs and testing time. This saves costs as well, obviously. Yeah, well, we keep hearing terms such as digital twin and model-based engineering to describe this type of design process, but really what it all means is using simulation models to test system behavior as completely and realistically as possible before ever building any hardware. That's right. Our focus is on what we call digital mission engineering, which is simply just another way of saying that at the end of the day, the mission is really what's important, and the ability to model as many systems and subsystems uh, digitally and then testing those in a simulation environment is by far the best approach to designing and deploying these systems. Our SDK software is used to build real-world scenarios for various types of missions, from modeling aircraft moving through hostile environments to satellite constellation motions and communications. Um, we'll hear more about these capabilities of SDK and what can be included in these scenario models later. Um, but connecting to other system simulation packages gives users the ability to add even more realism to their scenarios. Oh, which is exactly what system designers are using our Pathwave system design software to do. Uh, joining baseband and RF simulation together and giving users accurate models of their system behavior adds another level of realism or, or model fidelity to the overall simulation. And on our side, we can connect users to hardware, circuit and electromagnetic simulation, and even add in custom-coded models to build out this overall virtual prototype. Excellent. So with that, let's begin with an overview of some of the capabilities of SDK for aerospace system and scenario modeling. Here to do that is our senior radar and communications expert, Dr. Haroon Rashid. Thank you, Ian and Wash. Now, I would like to focus on how to model advanced radar systems with different and varying levels of fidelity and what aspects of models are critical. These models are used to analyze performance of radar systems under dynamic conditions of the scenario 
or the objectives of the missions these are intended for. Here is a simple model of a radar system. Uh, as we all know how radars operate, they pump or they transmit a lot of energy into uh, the uh, atmosphere or in, in the towards the directions of their targets with the hope that some of that energy will come back to the radar system. At the same time, we may have jammers or parties who want to disrupt the, or uh, impair the performance of that radar system. Uh, in the end, the radar system will try to detect a target and then it will uh, determine its positions, range, etc., and then maybe raise an alarm if it uh, needs to. So let us look at what are the issues which are facing the mission planners or the radar system performance analysts. Uh, they are mostly concerned about the performance of the radar systems uh, under varying uh, resource constraints. Uh, for instance, uh, if you are trying to track multiple targets, are there enough antenna beams available? Uh, are there different types of waveforms available to deal with different target configurations or the target uh, uh, the situations? Or can it switch uh, waveforms uh, based on the scenario event? For instance, uh, target range. As you know, that there are waveforms which are suitable for very far targets, uh, which, which are uh, beyond uh, 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 the near range of the radar. So in this case, for instance, those waveforms have a very high power and probably low uh, pulse repetition uh, frequency or the PRF. We are interested in how well the radar is able to determine the target's attributes, for instance, its positions, velocities, uh, directions, the attitude of the radar, and the range of the radar, and, and sometimes uh, the, the accelerations and the directions. Uh, also, we need to uh, account for the uh, different scenarios. For instance, if the radars are airborne, uh, what's their location uh, on the platform? Uh, if it's an aircraft, maybe the radar antennas are on the wings of the aircraft or in the center of the aircraft. Uh, again, the, the models need to account for the, the, how well it's able to handle the Doppler shifts or uh, how well it's able to account for the changes in attitude of the uh, targets and and compute the polarization mismatch which may occur because of the fluctuating RCS. The most of the older radar types are usually single channel which are transmitting on one uh, uh, polarized signal uh, but most of the radar uh, advanced radars are uh, transmitting on dual polarized channels so they are transmitting two signals as a combination of, uh, let's say, uh, right-hand circular or left-hand circular polarized signals or a vertical or a horizontal polarized signals. Uh, but at the same time, then it requires to increase fidelity. We need to have a complex polarized scattering radar cross-section for the targets where they each uh, a point on the uh, RCS matrix is a two by two 
uh, uh, complex block uh, matrix. Uh, in order to enhance fidelity, uh, sometimes we can use uh, plugins where plugins can then model the behavior of uh, uh, different target RCS. Another major aspect in selecting uh, a good model for the radar systems is the probability of detection uh, model. Uh, there are can there are several types which are used, and and uh, some are suited more for different types of scenarios than others. So we really need to look at our scenario and also look at uh, what type of probability of detection and the constant false alarm rate uh, or C for algorithms will be suitable. Uh, at the same time, the, the, the plugin options also help us in uh, developing new types of probability of detection models or experiment with the ones uh, which uh, may have different approaches to the detection. We want our radar receivers to be highly, highly sensitive uh, so that we can detect uh, target returns which are very low in, in, in power. Uh, that sensitivity uh, has a risk. We have to protect our amplifiers uh, when we are getting stronger signals uh, from clutter or from targets which are very close to the radar system. So, of course, uh, we need to have good models for uh, sensitivity time control or STC. Uh, those can be modeled with uh, 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 mathematical models like decay factor or delay uh, decay slope, or sometimes radars build their own STC maps, and we can import those maps to enhance the fidelity of our models. Uh, again, uh, we keep on uh, uh, emphasizing that uh, we have. Uh, uh, the use of plugins at our disposal to bring in better or newer approaches to STC control. And those can then help us increase the fidelity again. Radars are normally transmitting at very low elevation angles to detect targets coming over the horizon. So they are highly impacted by reflections from uh, our terrain, and, and it is important to have good models uh, and being able to account for terrain in as much virality as possible. The most of the advanced radar systems are multifunction in nature. The radars are able to process multiple tasks concurrently, and these tasks may be scheduled by users or these may be, uh, for instance, having different uh, uh, start and stop times, or these may be uh, based on events happening in the scenario. And, and, and multiple beams uh, can be assigned different tasks to, uh, to be operated simultaneously. This is like having multiple radar systems working simultaneously. The flexibility in being able to configure these beams independently goes a long way. Each beam can have its own gain, its own beam width, and in order to uh, conform to the antenna physics, uh, the side lobe gain is computed using uh, the gain and the beam width. Uh, of course, the users can also uh, control how these beams are directed or pointed, and, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail in that a little later. Waveform is a critical element of any radar signal. 
being able to model different types of waveform, different uh, characteristics of waveform, helps our radar system performance considerably. Uh, being able to model uh, waveforms with different PRFs or pulse repetition frequency with different pulse widths, different frequency and different power levels. Those actually help us design waveforms which can be used and designated for different types or, uh, or different types of targets or different uh, tasks which we assign uh, to a radar system or radar beam. Uh, and here is an example of how we can use different waveforms for a task. For instance, we want to continuously track a target at different ranges. As we know, the different waveforms are suitable for different range uh, zones. So we can actually divide the uh, ranges into different zones and then have the radar system select a waveform a more appropriate for that range zone. Uh, so in this case, as we can uh, see in this example, that we can designate 25, 50, or 200 kilometers as the range limits, and the radar system will switch waveforms based on the target's range at any time instant. As I said earlier, we may want the beams to have tasks of different types. For instance, we may want uh, a, a certain beam to just uh, focus on a certain uh, direction and, 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 and then keep uh, uh, trying to detect targets coming from those uh, directions. Or uh, we want it to track uh, an object uh, and continuously they locked onto that object, or we could have a simple a spinning uh, radar beam, which is then trying to scan the horizon or a zone, and then trying to detect targets coming over from any direction. So we have a simple uh, uh, example of a video, which actually shows you uh, different beams in the scenario which are assigned different tasks, and they are operating simultaneously, and they are doing different tasks at the same time. The model designers have a complete control over the radar beams activities. For instance, they can be always active or they can be controlled by uh, time components uh, which are computed based on some object activity. Or they can just be collection of time intervals which dictate how those uh, uh, beams will be active. A time component is a very powerful tool which it can take the uh, events based on many objects in the scenario. Here is a very simple example. Uh, a radar is, with six beams, is assigned to track six different objects in the scenario. So we want to see if the radar is able to detect an in incoming threat over the horizon while it's still busy uh, with its task. In this case, multifunction radar performance analysis will be carried out using each of the beams. And then by looking at the probability of detection results, we will be able to see which of those beams are suited to detect incoming targets, or if we need to reconfigure our system to improve its performance uh, level. There are times when we want to increase the fidelity from a system level 
to component level. Uh, that's where we collaborate with Keysight. We integrate AGI's system toolkit, SDK, with Keysight's pathwave system design and its component system view. That can help us model things like amplifier adaptive control gain uh, in, in, in the radar system. In order to go into details, we have Dr. Wilfredo Rivas Torres. He is an expert in the key size pathway system view products, and he will lead us into the details how to model those and show us examples. Dr. Wilfredo, please. Hi. Now, let's work on how to bring your real world scenario based on SDK into your system design using our pathway system design platform. For this, we will use this scenario, which is an airplane and three different radars. There's two on the coast and one on the ship. And you can see the aircraft dynamics as it moving, as well as the ship is moving. So inside of pathway system design, what you would do is first, make sure you select the ADI SDK link library. Then take the SDK interface and place it on the schematic. Notice there's no pins, but double click on it and you'll see that the that uh, a system view is already speaking to the AGI SDK scenario. Next, we play, select the to and from objects, so from the ship to the aircraft. You will need to have a report styles because this is what tells system view what kind of parameters are available. Notice that when you select OK, the model automatically updates so it outputs the data that it receives from SDK. Now let's take the SDK interface that we have set up. Let's do a quick simulation between the two tools. And so we can look at a few parameters in our case, Doppler shift and loss. Here's the plot for Doppler shift. Um, notice how we go through these transition regions where the aircraft turns at about five and 10 minutes in this scenario, the same thing for the loss. You can see there's some transitions going on in the same period of time. The rest of the presentation, we will show you how to now run your complete system based on this scenario inside a pathway system. My agenda today includes an introduction to electronic support with a proposed architecture for our EW receiver. We will talk about automatic gain control, how in Pathwave design system we include the scenario from SDK, and then at the end we'll do some electronic support measurements and produce a report. An effective countermeasure system depends on upfront knowledge of your adversarial signals. So electronic support aims at analyzing these non-cooperative signals. So an ES or electronic support system will receive, identify, and locate these hostile emitters. So the real challenge here is to receive multiple emitter signals, identify, and analyze their parameters. On this slide, we're showing the input to our electronic warfare receiver that is mounted on the aircraft that we showed in the SDK scenario and connected through pathway system design. Notice that we have highlighted two uh, pulses here that seem to have a, a, a shape that is not typical of a regular radar emission. So we would like to investigate this further. On the prior slide, we were looking at the input of the receiver with the signal coming from the three radars. This was a composite signal. Now, one of the advantages of using pathway system design is we can actually separate the contribution of each one of those radars, and we have color-coded them on this slide. With that, we can see that those pulses that seem to have a strange shape is nothing more than the fact that two of the, our emitters or radars have pulses arriving at the input of the receiver at the same time, a condition that is known as 
pulse on pulse. Now that we have established that we have a link to the scenario and that we know that our signals are kinematically aware from our link to the scenario in STK, we want to propose an EW architecture, receiving architecture, so that we can produce a report on the signals that we're going to be analyzing. So things like the angle of arrival, the pulse width, the bandwidth are some of the parameters that we want to be able to extract that information from the signals that we captured. This is our proposed receiver architecture. Now notice that on the aircraft, we have two antenna ports that are connected to two omnidirectional antennas whose output goes into our RF front end, which is 10 gigahertz wide. It covers from 8 to 18 gigahertz. We took the 10 gigahertz and we split it into 50, 200 megahertz wide channels. The output of the front end will go into this AGC circuit or automatic gain control so that we assure that we have enough dynamic range for our analog to digital converters or ADCs to operate. Then we take these two outputs and then we will do some digital signal processing on it to extract the information that we need. Here is the RF front end design. Now, it's fairly complex. Notice that we have an X band and a KU band track and uh, the down converters and the switch. So you can decide to, to separate this into different teams. So there can be a duplexer LNA team, right? Part of your team can be designing the X band portion of the LNA uh, and filter that follows. Then the same thing for the KU band and some, someone else can be doing the, the duplexer that's in, at the input. Uh, the same thing for the down converter and switch. Those can be several people working on a team. And in a tool like Pathway System Design, we can then combine all these together and you can analyze the complete design. In the Pathway System Design package, you will find there's two domains that we actually operate. So we operate in the frequency domain and in the time domain. Time domain is where we were to find all our signals and waveforms. And we'll talk about some of those analysis a little bit later. This is our RF design platform, many times we call it Spectrasys. Notice how we have a duplexer and uh, plus LNA block and we have a down converter plus switch block. Again, because we separate it in, in different teams. Now at the top level, we connected these two together and then we're putting a source, uh, and I know it says source one, but there's actually three signals coming out of it to show that our platform has selectivity, for example. We are gonna be interested mainly in our 9.3 gigahertz, 30 megahertz wide signal. And that is the channel selected to receive that is channel seven. Now, in the simulation, we always analyze one channel at a time. But in the real world, you could, for example, scan these 50 channels if you want to. We are not doing that in our simulation today, but that is certainly capability that is part of our tool and you could do it as well. Next, we will show some characteristic measurements and set up for an analysis such as this. The tool also comes with a built-in MATLAB. So none of the toolboxes, but you do not need an extra license of MATLAB. It comes with the tool. What that does, it allows us to create these equation-based uh, emitter setups and later on analysis. They're all based on MATLAB, which is fairly uh, common around the industry. Notice that on the left here, we set up all our sources, like for the three radars that we were going to be using, uh, some scenario setup. You also see how the EW receiver channelization logic works also as well. Here, we're looking at our first result from an RF analysis. It's a cascaded analysis, and we can look at several parameters. There's much more than the unique things about our tool is look at the x-axis. These are the components, the actual components that the signal goes through. So you can see what path exactly you're analyzing. And you can see uh, sometimes strange behaviors. I like to look at the total node power, which it's everything at, the, at, at that node. And then there's the channel power or the DCP. It's quite interesting to the input of the duplexer 
the total note power is greater than the desired channel power, right? And the reason for that is, remember I told you that we have actually three signals at the input? Right after you go to the duplexer, which filters out those unwanted signals, you are left with the two uh, quantities equal. This is our AGC circuit design. So we're moving uh, from the RF portion to the time domain. This is our first time domain uh, circuit that we're showing today. Um, Notice that uh, for the AGC, we have a peak detector. So the idea behind the peak detector is to feed it into a comparator. And if the signal is above a certain threshold, we then apply gain to it. We also have a log detector. And the function of the log detector is to tell us what the magnitude of the signal is. So if the signal is on the lower side, um, we would apply a gain as the gain set point, in this case, 25 dB. And if the signal increases in level, we would apply less gain to the signal through this IF amplifier too, which is a, is a variable gain amplifier. We took our proposed ADC circuit and we did some dynamic tests on it. So we provided an input signal, sort of think of it as, as, as a, a ramp in amplitude, if you wish. And uh, we analyzed the signal below the threshold, and we were expecting to get no gain. That's what this blue trace is, and you can see that the gain is zero. Um, as soon as the signal is above our threshold, we begin to apply gain. And at the beginning, we provide about 25 dB of gain. And then after that, the gain begins to drop as the signal level increases. All along, our purpose of this AGC circuit is to make sure that for those signal levels that we're interested in, we provide an adequate signal dynamic range input to our analog to digital converter. Now that we feel fairly confident that our receiver and our ADC circuits will perform as uh, needed for this mission, let's do a complete system analysis. So we'll have the three emitters or the three radars. We'll go to the SDK channel and then through our receiver and we'll do our signal processing. Uh, but before showing the results of the complete simulation, let me spend some time explaining to you how the emitters are set up. And then in the middle here is the SDK interface for the simulation. When we first talked about this scenario, I mentioned that we had three emitters. There's two radars on the coast, and then there's a ship. Um, each one of these emitters gets a transmitter uh, assigned to it in our simulation inside of pathway system design. Now to the far left here, we, I have this slider. This is just a convenience for our simulation so that we know which one of the three is our intended uh, uh, target for analysis in our simulation. And you could switch uh, to e any one of these, but that does it, it make sure that the receiver looks at the one channel that it has to. Now, at all times, all three of them are emitting signals, so any intermodulation distortion or anything like that is included in this simulation. Based on our scenario, we would know that there are three paths from the aircraft to each one of our emitters or radars. However, there's really six because the aircraft actually has two receivers. So from each receiver to each of the radars, we need to establish a channel for the signal to propagate through. And that's what this setup is showing. And then we take those signals and we appropriately combine them to create the aggregate signal that goes into our rec receivers through the aircraft ports. Remember this? This is the input to the receiver from the scenario. So once it goes through the different paths, the signals end up at the aircraft ports and input to our receiver. Now, this is the pulse on pulse. Can our proposed architecture deal with this and deal with it properly? And that's what we're going to show next. So we're going to, we ran the simulation and we want to show that we are dealing with this properly. Okay, so here's the result at the output of our receiver um, right before we go into signal processing. So output of the analog to digital converter. And if you look closely, you'll see that 
our pulse no longer no longer shows any ill effects from the pulse on pulse. Now, we couldn't separate the two pulses in time, right? Because they they happen to arrive at the same time. So we have to separate them in frequency, which means we created the right filters and we have been able to separate them. Now, there's uh, things that you have to consider. Things like, did we create any aliasing when we sampled the signal? Are there any intermod products that fall within the bandwidth? So if you did your design correctly, you should only see the pulses that you're interested and no ill effects as we are showing here. Zooming in to our pulse to see some more of the details, we now, uh, it's what we're showing on this slide, and now we can actually see that there's the two pulses from the two receivers. Remember, there's two paths in our receiver. So there's two analog to digital converters. So this is the output of both of them. Notice that we've named one RX1 in red and the blue is RX2. Notice that they are shifted in time ever so slightly, but this is what we intended to, right? Those two antennas on our aircraft have a certain separation, so the signals do arrive slightly delayed one with respect to the other. And this difference is what we call time difference of arrival, which we use to determine the angle of arrival as we showed on an earlier slide. So far, we've done some individual testing, uh, our receiver, and, and we've looked at some of the pulses. Now, let's do a, a, a com more complete study of our design. And we decided to look at a couple of parameters. So on the top here, that's the pulse width from the radar stations and the ship, and on the bottom is the bandwidth. Now, the total flight time in this scenario is approximately a little over 15 minutes. Now, instead of running the whole 15 minutes, what we do is we take samples, and just for our presentation here today, we do samples every one minute, and we run the signal for a couple of milliseconds, just to gather enough pulses to analyze it. Now. Interesting, let's look at radar station one. Did you notice that radar station one, after like 13 minutes, there's no data? Apparently our receiver failed. Well, no, not necessarily. What happens is the receiver at that point is so far from radar station one that the signal is probably too low, right? There's so much loss and you're probably just picking up noise. So this is, this is actually true, right? Then you can see what kind of shape uh, you get from uh, the dots here, uh, the, the the data here, and um, what what is kind of interesting is you can almost see uh, for each one of the time samples you can kind of see what the spread of the signal is. Now looking at radar station two, right at the beginning, it's our receiver seems to be doing a good job. There's a lot of spread though, and the results you can see the points are kind of stretched up to around five minutes. Now, kind of interesting, five minutes and 10 minutes, that, that's where the aircraft turns, right? That's that 90-degree turn, uh, both five and 10 minutes. So after six minutes, which is when the aircraft starts to point at closely to radar station two, we start to pick up some uh, good data, right? And what that is telling us is probably we're just in the range where we're a little too far, and that's why we had all the variability in our measurements, right? Now, looking at the ship, the ship is interesting because it's in the middle of the flight path all the time. And you can kind of see these inflection points both at 5 and 10, right? It seems like something is changing there. Um, it, and that's exactly where the aircraft, again, is turning, right? So every time it turns, it's looking at uh, the, the ship differently. And um, so you get a, uh, some different kind of uh, um, results from that. Let's do a quick wrap-up here. So. We looked at our electronic warfare receiver architecture we, that we proposed and we validated using pathway system design. We know that our results included the mission kinematics because that's what we obtained from STK. And uh, with that information, we carry a time variant channel inside of our tool. We looked at parameters such as the pulse width, the bandwidth, the angle of arrival, all of these during the time that the, uh, our aircraft is moving or flying. Uh, our cost simulation with AGI system toolkit or STK and pathway system design 
provides the needed platform for designers so they can include their mission parameters during their design and validation stages. This solution provides the means to understand how the design will perform in a virtual test flight, which has the potential to save costs by reducing the numbers of field flight tests, which are incredibly expensive. For those of you who would like further information here, please come visit us at um, both the AGI and the Keysight links as shown here. And with that, I pass this back to our moderator from some Q&A. Thanks, Alfredo, and thanks, Haroon. Okay, and here's our first question, and this one's for you, Haroon. How and what type of noise is accounted for in computing SNR? Well, um, uh, FTK can uh, look at uh, noise external to the antennas, on the antennas, uh, uh, such as uh, sun, atmosphere, ionosphere, rain, and on the antenna, things like cables, filters, and even down to the receiver, noise such as the low noise amplifier temperatures, noise figure, cables, temperatures, etc. Uh, because STK will follow the signal flow computation through all stages of devices and propagation. And after the receiver, uh, low noise amplifier or LNA the, the signal powers and the noise powers are then combined to compute uh, figures of merit like uh, SNR or G over S, uh, et cetera. Great, thanks. And, and here's another question for you, Haroon. You have not talked about jamming. How do you protect the radar system from jamming? Um, well, uh, the reason I've uh, not talked about jamming is because it is a big subject by itself and it would really merit uh, a, a webinar on its own uh, and which uh, uh, I have done that previously. Uh, the, the jamming is really uh, taken as a complete signal flow and it is tracked independently for all jamming sources uh, it passes through propagation, antennas, filters, uh, LNA, and then the jamming powers at the receiver are used to compute uh, signal-to-noise plus jamming ratios. Uh, in this case, uh, the, each jammer can be tracked independently and, or, or, and as well as the uh, combined impact of all the jammers. Uh, also, uh, things like RF filters or adaptive nulling phased array antennas can be used to reduce the impact of uh, uh, these jamming sources. So uh, the capabilities are there, but being a large topic, it, an important topic itself, uh, we uh, left it out of the scope of this webinar. Okay, well, Fredo, well, the next couple questions are for you. So here's the first one. Is there any limit to the number of objects that System View and SDK can handle together? In fact, there isn't. There's no limitation. If uh, you noticed in the scenario that we were presenting, I actually had some cell towers near the coast. Those are, were not connected in the simulation but could easily be connected to include more communication, civilian communication type signals. In the analysis, uh, you could have added more radars. Uh, one request that I've heard is people requesting, uh, can we put more receivers on the aircraft? Absolutely. And that's actually what happens in the real world. Now, at some point, uh, you will have so many of these little blocks that you'll get tired of, uh, of doing those manually. The, our tools in, inside a system view, we have something that's called a recursive circuit, which is a capability that allows a sub-circuit to sort of replicate itself. So that would make the simulation um, schematic a, a lot less uh, congested, right? So you'd have a lot more space. Great, thanks. And then here's your um, second question. 
At the beginning of the scenario, radar 2, the pulses are still detectable at about the same distance at which radar 1 fails. I think that means the signal from the first radar fades faster than the one from radar 2. Oh, uh, interesting question, and great that you noticed. Yes, actually what happens with uh, radar number 1 and number 2 is they're not at the same frequency. So you already notice, as in my comments, that I said something about radar 2 is already seems to have had a little bit of difficulty, but it was still enough. But it turns out that radar 2 is at a lower frequency, around 12.5 gigahertz, if you remember the setup, while radar 1 is at 15.5. So that easily uh, accounts for why it seems to fade faster. Great. Thank you. Okay, so I have another question for you, Haroon. Can you model the over-the-horizon radar system for high-frequency radar systems? Uh, well, thank you for this question, because this topic keeps uh, coming up. Uh, I have heard it at many radar conferences I have attended. Um, HF band or the high-frequency band uh, has been neglected mainly due to advances in satellites, which can reach around the globe far beyond uh, normal frequencies. And, but now there is a new surge in the high frequency band, and this is mainly due to advances in the signal processing capabilities of modern hardware. Uh, so, I mean, we have embarked on a project uh, to integrate uh, high frequency band uh, in our analysis. Uh, and this uh, 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 is a very large project and we are hoping to have this facility or capability available uh, in the very near future. That's great news, great, thank you. And uh, this will need to be the last question. This will be for you, Wilfredo. I noticed that the results for pulse width and bandwidth looks similar for all three radars. Is this to be expected? Well, this is an interesting question, and it comes back to the fact that we uh, see the similar shapes because the pulse width and the bandwidth of the signals are correlated to each other. So you can expect a wider pulse has a lot more time and, and, and it changes the frequency for a lot longer time when it's narrow it has less time to do that. Uh, and the reason the pulse width would change in something like this is because we are accurately, accurately uh, capturing all the relativistic effects. So there's pulse dilation and compression going on during our simulation. So we do expect those to have the same shape. In fact, if we didn't see that, that would be an indication that something is amiss in our simulation. So this is another uh, good observation that lets us know that, in fact, we have a fairly high fidelity modeling going on. Great. Thanks so much, Wilfredo. I just want to thank you and Haroon, and, and it's always great to work with our partners. And any closing comments before we close? Well, uh, uh, I wanted to say that Ever since I had the chance to get training on system view, uh, I have learned a lot and benefited from it a lot. As, a, uh, as an engineer who is really involved in modeling high fidelity radar systems, uh, integration between system view and SDK has benefited me a lot. And I hope that this partnership and this integration uh, will continue and we will uh, be able to enhance uh, the, this capability and further increase the fidelity of the models which we build. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Arun. And thanks again, Wilfredo, for your wonderful presentation. Thanks again for attending today's webinar brought to you by Keysight Technologies and AGI. Join us next month for the continuation of our engineering education webinar series and enjoy your day.